scripture I was just saying. Lord, thou art life, though we are dead. Love's fire, thou art however cold we be. Nor heaven have we, nor place to lay our head, nor home but thee. Be that home for Laodicea. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Nobody likes to be called a name. Ah, I'll tell you, it sticks with you. I remember I was playing basketball with a bunch of guys at college. One of the guys turned to me in the middle of a play and said, you sissy. <laughs> Obviously, I've never forgotten it. It sticks with you. Because nobody likes to be called names. And I finally figured out why we have such a hard time with the letter, the last letter. The very last letter of the Bible. The last letter of the book of Revelation. It's to a, a, a community called Laodicea. Seven little churches, they're number seven, the last before the return of Christ. I finally figured out this week, why did it take me so long, why we don't like that letter. And that's why we don't read the letter, by the way. We don't like it, we don't read it. Because you know what? It feels like Jesus is calling us five names, five adjectives. And it makes us mad. I don't have to, be, I don't have to put up with this stuff. I don't have to read a letter like this. You want to call me that? A lot of time I'll read your word. Five, nobody likes to be called a name. We got to detoxify this thing or we're going to have this innate resistance to a letter that's critically essential for our survival. We have to demystify it. We have, we have to do something with those five names. They are hardly complimentary. They feel on the border of derogatory. And when somebody calls you a name that's derogatory, you never forget it. Trust me. I'm going to show you these five names. And then tell you that, in fact, these five adjectives, these five names were embraced by Jesus and became his five adjectives, became his five names on the cross. Watch this. Open your Bible to the last letter, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Drop down to verse 17. Red letters in my Bible. Because Jesus is dictating this letter. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, to the last, to the end game, church of Christianity. Verse 17, you say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing, but you do not realize, you do not know, here it comes now, five names he's going to call that church. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and what's that last word? Naked. Nobody likes to be called naked. And yet all five of those were the names Jesus embraced upon the cross. Wretched? <laughs> you kid? Desire of Ages actually uses the word wretch. Some poor wretch came up with a full frontal spit, clearing his throat into the face of Christ. Jesus said, you can call me wretched. Go ahead, spit on me. Wretched, pitiful. Some of your translations render it miserable. Miserable. By the way, that's the very word that the Bible uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, to describe how miserable we are. If the, if the, if the story of the resurrection is not true, we are miserable. We are pitiable. Do you know what? The Jesus, Jesus, when he's hanging on the cross for you and me, when he's hanging on that cross, he believes that he's on a dead-end destiny. Dead-end meaning he's ending his life forever and ever in the grave. He's pitiful. He's miserable. Wretched. Pitiful. Pitiful. Poor. Poor. <laughs> the prisoner. <laughs> because it is the custom of the Roman soldiers who have to waste their time waiting for this victim to die it is the custom that whatever he has left they dice for but the prisoner has nothing nothing but an outer garment and it's seamless and so rather than ripping it into pieces they throw dice who gets it that's how poor he was wretched miserable poor blind do you know what that somewhere it reads 
and the Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. He was blind. Can't see. You know what? Every time I think about, every time I brood over that reality, it, it, just, it, just, it just blows my mind. I mean, can you imagine? He was willing to die forever and ever so that I, little old me, can live forever and ever. Go figure. Die forever and ever so that you might live forever and ever. He's blind. He couldn't see past his nose. Wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Yeah, you got it. There isn't an artist alive that has ever painted the actual picture of the crucifixion. You know why? Because he, it would be rated X. You can't show a man like that. So every artist's rendition of the, of the cross... There's a loincloth. There's something that's hiding his masculinity. That was intentional. Barbaric. By the Romans. We'll shame you to your last moment and breath. And all of hell stood there with their cat calls and wolf whistles. Trying to shame him back up, down from that cross before he dies a victor. Wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. And here we thought he was calling us names. When in fact, they're the five names that became his at Calvary for you and for me. Detoxify the letter. The one who writes this letter is in love with you. It's, he's in love with the human race, but he's passionately, desperately, in love with the last church on earth. Open your Bible with me, please. To Revelation 3. If you didn't open it last time, open it now. I want to pick up right at the beginning of the letter. The title of this teaching, Reading in Between the Lines. You see it on the screen there? Reading in, the last letter. Reading in between the lines. You see a website there, newperceptions.tv. You go there, there's a study guide today. You'll have it. It'll be ready and waiting for you. You just go to that study guide, get that study guide and download it right now. But we're going to keep going. Let's pick it up, Revelation 3. Now, at the top of the letter. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write. These are the words of the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds. That you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, half and half, neither cold, neither hot, I'm about to vomit you, New King James, out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. You do not know. The word there is no. And if he tries to soften it up, you do not realize. No, it's you do not know. And you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So, verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. There's a bit of tomfoolery going on in between the lines of this letter. We don't quite catch it because embedded in the letter is a dialectic. It is a contradiction between two realities. Reality number one, I know, I know who you are. I know what you are. Reality number two about Laodicea, you do not know, you do not know who you are. I know, let's put it on the screen, I know versus you do not know. Now look, the ancient Greek sages used to declare, know thyself. It was a fine, a fine invitation and Socrates comes along a few centuries later and he waxes eloquent on that little line, know thyself, with his line, the unexamined life is not worth living. So yes, it's good counsel. It's good counsel to know yourself, to know what's going on inside of me. But the, 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 the tragedy of Laodicea is they have no clue what reality is. They do not know themselves. And you know why we can't know ourselves? I'll tell you why. Because the biggest liar alive is you. You're the biggest liar alive. And maybe me. The biggest deceiver we live with is ourselves. We are hoodwinked by our own self-delusion and self-deception. We're hoodwinked and we believe the lie. <laughs> Mercy. A few weeks ago, I came across this line in uh, Oswald Chambers' book, My Utmost for His Highest. I read that, a page out of that book every day of my life. 
been at it for decades. Oswald Chambers on the screen. We have to get rid of the idea that we understand ourselves. It is the last conceit to go. The only one who understands us is God. The greatest curse in spiritual life, write it down, is conceit. End quote. Come on, that's verse 17. Read it again. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and I don't need a thing. But you do not know that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. The greatest curse in spiritual life is conceit. By the way, may I remind you, it was the Achilles heel of Lucifer. Turns out it's the Achilles heel of Laodicea. Both of those L's. Loser. Achilles heel. Here's a stunner. From, would you believe it, Ella White. Steps to Christ. That little classic on the screen. God does not regard all sins as of equal magnitude. Oh, really? Well, tell me, what, the, the, what, what are the greatest sins in God's eyes? Well, keep reading. The drunkard. We'd say today the alcoholic, all right, or the drug addict. The drunkard is despised and is told that his sin will exclude him from heaven, while pride, selfishness, and covetousness too often go unrebuked. But these are sins. What are sins? Pride, selfishness, and covetousness. These are sins that are especially offensive to God. Have mercy. Especially offensive. For they are contrary to the benevolence of God's character, to that unselfish love that Charles just sang about which is the very atmosphere of the unfallen universe. She who falls into some of the grosser sins may feel a sense of her shame and poverty and her need of the grace of Christ, but pride feels no need. And so it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give. I have need of nothing, pride boasts. <laughs> We're living with a liar. It's me. Sigby Tonstadt. Our New Testament scholar friend from uh, Loma Linda. In that essay, he wrote a blog on the seven churches. Boy, does he nail it for, for uh, Laodicea. I'll put Tonstad on the screen for you. The Laodicean community revels in a sense of wholeness, ensconced within an all round edifice of accomplishment. The community has no sense of need. Italics are his. We should assume that the community is too sophisticated to say openly the things attributed to it, but it is capable of behaving in ways that convey the attitude described. And now here's, here, here's where he nails it. The message to the community is the keenest statement of how difficult it is to see the discrepancy between self-representation and reality. Write that down. The way I see myself in reality, whoo, Laodicea, here's who you are, here's what you think you are. I know you, but you, church, I'm telling you what, you do not know you. Verse 17, again, you say I am rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not know that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. He's not calling us names, he said I became that. Everything that Laodicea is, I became, so that everything I have, Laodicea may receive. Oh, verse 18, and so I counsel you. Now we've got to go on. Verse 18, so I counsel you to buy of me gold. Now, don't, don't, doesn't that just make you want to interrupt Jesus? I mean, Lord, please, time out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> the anachronism of what you just said. You just, you just had the temerity to call us poor. And by the way, we're taking it rather personally, these five names, these five adjectives you've chosen. You just called us poor. And then you have the temerity to turn to us and say, and by the way, you poor folk, I need you to buy from me gold. Go figure. How are we going to be able to buy when we're poor? Because you and I, in the third millennium, we, we live with uh, buying and selling. We do it online, eBay, Amazon, Craigslist. You name the site, we go there because we do buying best. But in the Oriental Western mind, that's not what they're thinking about when they're thinking about, when they're thinking about shopping. In fact, God himself, Isaiah 55, on the screen, please. God himself speaking, come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no what? You got no money. I understand that. You who have no money, come buy. Wait a minute. You just said we have no money. He said, I did. I want you to come and buy. Now keep reading. 
Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. You know what's going on here? It's just God's way of reminding you and me that what he has to give us is priceless. It's, a, it's, it's beyond anything we could possibly purchase ourselves. Jot this down. Without money and without cost means you'll never have enough money to buy it, so I'll never charge you a penny to have it because it's priceless. And priceless means it's free. No price, no cost to you. And then he, and then he says, listen, I'm going to sell you three things right now that are priceless and free. And here they come. Boom, boom, boom. Gift number one, two, three. Jot them down. Gift number one. Here we go. Three infinitely priceless gifts for the end game church. Gift number one, I counsel you to buy from me gold. Write that word in gold. Because you know what? Laodicea knows all about gold. In fact, they have a reputation in the empire for having the largest whole hoard of gold available. They have this massive banking exchange. They are so proud of their wealth. Jesus looks down at them and he says, hey, guys, the gold you have, let me, let me just let you in. The gold you have, it's fool's gold. It'll not buy you a thing. I have the real deal. Come to me. And for free, buy my gold. What's the gold? What's the gold? 1 Peter 1, 7, on the screen, jot it down, that the genuineness of your faith, right in the word faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation and return of Jesus Christ. The pure gold of a humble faith in Christ. In fact, it turns out that the faith they have is not my faith, it's his faith. You remember Hebrews chapter 2, verse 13? A couple of falls ago, you and I spent a whole season just thinking about, wow, Jesus, seven-word credo. Let's put Hebrews 2, 13 on the screen. Let's, 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 let's do this out loud, out loud together. These are the seven words Jesus lived by. I will put my trust in him. That's it. Jesus lived by that. Radical faith. I will put my trust in him. His own seven-word credo. The gold of his faith in the Father. And guess what? If he had faith in the Father that was perfect from stem to stern, what the, the gold is, we got to get his faith. It's not my faith that counts. If I can just get his faith, I got it. And that's the point of the end game, Laodicea Church. Look at them described in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There's no missing verb there. There's not intended to be a verb there. It really reads, here are they who keep the commandments of God and keep the faith, baby. They keep the faith of Jesus. Whose faith is it, church? Whose faith is it? Come on, church, tell me. Whose faith is it? It's Jesus' faith. It's not my faith. It's not your faith. We're not saved by our faith. We're saved by his faith. We got this whole thing wrong. We've, been, we've made us the center of the universe, and the sun revolves around us, like Galilee finally discovered is wrong. The earth's in the middle. Everybody believed back then, and the sun revolves around the earth. Wrong. The truth is, the sun is in the middle, and the earth revolves around the sun. It's his faith, not mine, that saves me. You understand that? It's his faith. That's why it's gold. You can't come up with it. You got a few pennies, but not enough. Gold, I counsel you, buy of me gold, faith. Oh, he's got three gifts. Gift number two, I counsel you to buy of me white robes. Oh, brilliant, Jesus. You really got Laodicea now. Because you know what the Laodiceans are proud of? They had a, they had a textile that they didn't have in the, in the rest of the, of the empire. They had sheep that fed on the grass around Laodicea. And those sheep had black wool. And when the black wool was woven, it was woven into a beautiful, with a violet sheen on it, black textile. And the Laodiceans, as a sign of their wealth, proudly put on black. And they said, black is the color of elegance and wealth. And Jesus said, hey, 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 time out, time out. I'm going to give you white robes. White robes. So when he says white robes, they get it. What are the white robes? The Bible's absolutely clear. Jot it down on the screen for you. Isaiah 61, verse 10. I 
delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The faith belongs to Jesus, and now I'm finding out the righteousness belongs to Jesus. The robe is his. <laughs> salvation is, is his. Jesus said, hey, Dwight, I'm looking at your messed up life. I got a deal for you. I came down to this planet and I lived a perfect life. And I did it for you. How about we exchange, huh? How about you let me have your filthy rags. And let me give you my white robe. Pure, spotless. So I doesn't say anything about Dwight's rags looking like that. Are you kidding? Isaiah 64, 6, put it on the screen. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Right? You messed up life. I'm willing every day to exchange the previous 24 hours with my spotless robe. Is that a deal? Are you serious? I give you my gold. I give you my robe. Wow. Reminds me of this, this often quoted popular line from Desire of Ages on the screen. Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, which we had no share. The robe's not mine, it's yours. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. I'll give you a robe. Wow, are you serious? Read it again, verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your, your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Gift number three, jot that down, please. I counsel you to buy from me eye salve. Now, don't forget, we can... We, if we miss this, we miss the connect that Jesus has. The Laodiceans are rather proud that they've come up with an eye cure in their very famous premier medical school known throughout the empire. They've come up with an eye cure through the creation of a medicine called collyrium. It's ma it was made from the ancient Phrygian stone which was embedded in one of the temples in Laodicea. And so they... they they powdered it up and they called it Phrygian powder. And they put that powder in their eyes. And it had the reputation of healing eye disease. Jesus comes along to them and says, you, your, 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 your eye salve is worthless. You're as blind as the three blind mice. Buy from me, eye salve, and you will begin to see again. <sighs> Ranko Stevanovich, and I believe he's right, describes this as the gift that Laodicea needs the most. Eyes to open, eyes healed to see. What are you talking about, Dwight? Eye salve. Oh, put it on the screen. Ephesians 1, verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart, fill that in, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Come on, put one more up there. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, rather, chapter 4, verse 6. Paul writing, the God of this age has blinded. Ooh, there's somebody going around here putting everybody's eyes out. Hey, yo, yo, come over here. <coughs> Can't see now, can you? Hey, girl, come over here. <coughs> Can't see now, can you? The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. But, keep reading, God made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Hey. Laodicea, time out, time out, time out. Do you understand? You have nothing. I give you my gold. Buy from me. I give it to you. The gold of my faith. Come here, come here, come here. I take these rags. I take these rags and I cover you with my spotless robe. Buy from me for free. Come here. Hey, look, look, you can't find me, can you? Come to the where you hear my voice. You can't see, but come right here. Let me touch your eyes. You will see again. Everything we need is from him. Right? It's all from him. Buy from me, I say. 
to heal your blind following after the God of this age and the fallen culture of this world. Boy, do you know where that path is headed that you're whistling down? Do you know where the Pied Piper's taking you, girl, where you're just a skipping down the, tra the trail? He's blinded you. Let me open. Let me heal your eyes. May I be honest with you? It's right here that I fear for my church. The Laodicea of today. So deadly has become our blindness. Now, I'm going to talk heart to heart here, and it might feel a bit, a bit critical. But I guess that's the whole point. Jesus is trying to break our delusion. Let me talk to you about the church. I love this church. But the truth of the matter is, third millennial Adventism is pretty much dead in the water. You can tell me otherwise. We have become a movement that is no longer moving, at least here in the West. We have fine, oh my. Uh, please don't misunderstand me, by the way. We have fine, beautiful church edifices. Whoa, look at this. We have sprawling, well-heeled university and hospital campuses. Wow. We have church headquarters bustling with state-of-the-art, all the state-of-the-art we need. But have you noticed? We're missing something, and it's becoming more painfully obvious by the day. Thomas Aquinas, the great mind of the... Middle Ages was once being given a personal tour by Pope Innocent II through the, through the Vatican, and the Pope led him down one corridor, and they noticed a table covered with gold bullion, gold. And the Pope stopped and he said, Thomas, you must see that the church can no longer say silver and gold, have we not? To which that bright mind replied, oh, yes, Holy Father. But neither can she say in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. Has it happened to us? Is church for contemporary Adventism a glorious facade? There's nothing behind it. No miracles, no power, no transformation, just a church with a fake front. Silver and gold we have, but we cannot say in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. I love this church. I've given my life to this church. A church now that is arguing, ad nauseum, by the way, something called compliance. And who has the power to do what with that power? And who gets the last word? And who takes the last vote? And which gender is the ruling gender? And which race is the ruling race? And by the way, we're very, we've got this passive-aggressive silence going on about race right now in the Adventist church. Passive-aggressive. We're scared to touch it. Because we're already indicted. And we know it. What's happened to Adventism in America... What Jonathan Walton calls in his book, 12 Lies That Hold America Captive, what Jonathan Walton calls white American folk religion, where the white male has ascended to his dominance. Interesting. Because the truth is, come on. The truth is, Adventism was birthed in this nation. We cannot help it, but America is in the DNA of Adventism. We can deny it. We say, no, we're, we're a global church. <laughs> we're a global church with American DNA. And America is hopelessly embroiled in racial fracture today. And the church cannot break out of the same. Silver and gold we have. But in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, we can't do a blooming thing. What's happened to the church? 
blinded eyes to the deeper systemic breakdown that being birthed when we were, where we were, blinded eyes that our debates can muffle but our debates cannot mask. And so all the while, while we play our little fiddles and our silly games, Rome burns and the world is dying. And we're not through yet because we have one more meeting. We're going to deal with it. How many meetings does it take? The world is dying. Do you understand that? Oh, Laodicea, Laodicea. How often I would have gathered you to me, but you would not. Silver and gold, we have plenty. But in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, we say so little. So what's going to save Laodicea? At the risk of sounding terribly simplistic, there is only one hope for Laodicea. J-E-S-U-S. That's it. Without the gold of his faith, without the robe of his righteousness, without the healing of, it, of his eye salve, we are toast. We are dead. It is finis. That's why this letter is so strong. It's trying to get somebody's attention while there's still time left. You know what we need? Who am I? Just a little guy in a big, big church. But what we need is a moratorium on debate. Just cut it out. Stop. We need a season where Jesus becomes the sole focus of our corporate talking and our private praying. Let our leaders, let our leaders, they're my leaders as well, let our leaders lead us for a season. And I'm not talking about a day of prayer. A day is nothing. Lead us in a season of days. Lead us in a season of months. Lead us in a season of weeks. Take charge of the conversation. Recalibrate the blogs. Reverse the fracture. Do something. But point us, please, to Jesus. We need a season where our collective worship, our, administra our administrative communiques, and our church journals collaborate to focus on the charms of Jesus and his righteousness. Make that the talk. Make that the talk and the prayer. Behold, Laodicea, I stand at the door. I'm beginning to pound. Do you not hear me in there? Or has your raucous debate drowned my voice, blinding your eyes and killing your church? For a season, in this season of the latter rain, what if we pause to ask for a season, to ask for the downpour of Jesus upon God's people? We have nothing else, folks. We have nothing else. I don't care where the meetings take place. I don't care who the meetings are led by. I don't care what. The agenda for the meetings is we have no hope out of Jesus, outside of Jesus. He's the only, he's the only solution left. When are we going to try him? That's the letter to Laodicea. I'm your friend. Wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. That was me. I was that on the cross for you. All that you are, I became, so that all that I have, you might have. Buy it from me for free. Come to me. 
buy it from me. Let me in. Let me in. I beg of you. Let me in. So that's it. That's my little heart to heart with you. If we don't do something soon, the last one out, turn out the lights. No power. No power. Just the game of church. We've been really blessed by the financial support that comes from our viewers. And we've made a conscious decision not to continually appeal to you for that support. The fact is, as everyone in the industry will tell you, we're needing to make constant upgrades to our technology. So if God has blessed you and you'd like to further the work of this ministry, we invite you to partner with us. Not a single penny of your donation will go to me. Every bit of your gift goes to the mission of blessing your community and our world. You can donate on our website, newperceptions.tv, or call the number, you know the number, 877-HIS-WILL. Again, that number is 877, the two words, His Will. And may the God who has blessed you continue to pour into your life the gifts of His joy and His hope. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you right here again next time.